the Mark of the Beast. Let us see if we cannot dispel some of the mystery that are connected with and have been passed on from generation to generation concerning this Mark of the Beast. Let us realize first we live in a real world and that God does not deal in comic book or fictitious characters, beast, animals. However, he does use symbols and symbology to indicate powers in the worlds today, saying more than is actually written. And if we look at it as animals or beasts, we miss the whole truth. I hope in this tape that we can prove who the beast is, where he will appear, and who he will appear to. If we look for a grotesque manister, monster, we're going to be deceived. You can be assured of that. So let us simplify this situation by going to the Word of God, which will always simplify everything. I ask you to go to the Bible with me, whereby you can clarify this for yourself. Let's go to the book of Revelation, which the 13th chapter deals with this situation. Chapter 13. Now, many people state that the book of Revelation is not to be understood, but the Revelation word, the very word itself, Revelation, means to uncover or to reveal, and you are to understand it, and let us understand that. Let us begin in chapter 13, verse 1. Let us understand. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. Water in Revelation, as you will find in the 17th chapter, will symbolize people. And what he's saying is, from the peoples of the world, I observe a beast rise up. These seven heads are seven dominions, are nations, or you could even say seven continents, being powers ruled by the ten world leaders. In, a, in other words, what we have is a one world system, or what is prophesied of many other times in the Bible, a one, one worldism, or a one world system. If we were to turn to the 17th chapter concerning the beast of this revelation, in 17 verse 3 we read, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names and blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations, and filthiness of her fornications. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abomination of the earth. So we see here that this mystery is connected with Babylon. And what does Babylon mean? It comes from the base root Babel, which means confusion. And confusion is a this being a state of confusion, and that confusion being in part that that has to do with you, the Babel that is coming, and the Babylon is the confusion in the one world system taught by man. Now, who are the ten men? Let's look at it. Ten men taken hold out of the world to bring about a state of confusion concerning one worldism that shall rise upon these people. Now, let's go back to 13, chapter 13. And you must understand there are two beasts mentioned in this 13th chapter. You must understand this. This first beast with multi heads is a political system. But when we get to the 11th verse of this chapter, you will find a religious or single beast, a religious beast. But a one world system that will ultimately have this one ruler that will take over from the ten leaders of the seven continents or the seven dominions. And what rides upon the world that brings about one worldism? a state of confusion that brings about babel or confusion upon the heads of people. The truth shall dispel the lies. And you find that truth in God's word, those events that consummate the end of this age that are well written in this letter that your father has written to you. God's elect will stand against this one world system inasmuch as they are the witnesses of God. Let's continue with verse 2 in chapter 13. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, a political system, do not forget, that is what this is, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, and his seat and great authority. We see in this, within it, that the dragon, as it is written in Revelation 20, the dragon, that old serpent, which is to say the devil, which is to say Satan. 
leads these particular animals or beasts, which are symbolic of various nations or stations. Uh, you can the leopard itself. You can relate to the book of Daniel in uh, to the panther or the leopard. Their spot is not of our spot. The bear will always have to do with Russia, that old iron curtain nation, which has fallen but is not fallen completely, and we shall hear more of it as we continue in this study. The lion, symbolic of that, that is of the tribe of Judah. Confusion, you bet. The old dragon, the leader of this particular group. Verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. How does a political beast receive a deadly wound? Certainly not a physical wound to an individual, but as they cry, peace, 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 and you hear the peace conferences in the New World Order as you hear of it today, it is that system, the so-called peace system, that will receive a deadly wound. That is to say, how does a system receive a deadly wound? It receives that wound by the peace being broken. Now let's pick it up in four. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Naturally, it is very difficult or impossible to make war with a nation if all nations were one involved in a one world system. And who can make war with a one world system? No one. With the exception, it is led by the dragon. And of course, the dragon being the enemy of Christ, God's elect shall make this stand. And it is important that you note that what did they worship? They worship the dragon, which is to say Satan and the one world ruler which will fulfill the role as Antichrist. Physically, no one could make war because there is total agreement in a one world system. Let's go on with five. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Of course, forty-two months is the equivalent of three and a half years, but where months are utilized in prophecy, months means moons, and they are always related to the night or darkness, which is to say Satan's time. Therefore, a prophecy that is given in months has to do with Satan, this great dragon, the old devil. Again, Revelation 20 or Revelation 12, 7. We see the three and a half approximate rule that this reign shall, be, uh, shall transpire. Let there be no mistake. But we, it is written in Mark 13 that the elect will not be deceived by this one, but shall do things in the name of our Father and on his behalf, which we'll be getting to as we come further along. Let's continue with six. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. As he comes as instead of Jesus, which is the correct translation for Antichrist, we see that he stands in the temple of God claiming to be God. Seven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Mark it. Nations means all the world. All the world. Eight. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. How many? All whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. This is a deep verse inasmuch as destiny is involved even to those that are chosen, as it is written in Ephesians verse one, chapter 1, rather, verse 4 chosen from the foundations of the world, those that have a destiny, those that will serve him. Could it be that you have a destiny? There are people in this earth now who are beginning to have their eyes open, their ears open, as to what this world political situation is developing into, and they know that they do have a destiny. This conspiracy that is between Christ and Antichrist, which is to say Satan, will continue. Most of the world will be deceived. My question would be to you, will you be deceived? Will you understand the mark of the beast? Are you familiar with God's word? He wrote the letter to you. Do you love him? Then he certainly loves you. Follow him. Listen to him. Verse 9. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Now, as a student of God's word, you must understand that he's about to say something important. Do you have ears to hear? Verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of and the faith of the saints. Do you want to be in captivity to Satan or in captivity by Christ himself in his sheepfold whereby the shepherd always protects his own? Are you ready to stand against a one world political system allowing him through the spirit to use you 
as we will find later. Let's investigate this word beast in the book of in the book of Revelation it is, as it is stated in the Greek manuscripts. Beast is simply a living thing. And now we're about to come to the religious beast, a living creature. Who? Well, if they worship the dragon, let that be a bit of a clue, all right? Let's look now at the second beast in this 13th chapter, the religious beast and the deceiver. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. That's to say he looked like the lamb. He looked like Christ, even the slaying lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So we see that we have the dragon playing the role as the lamb of God, our Messiah, and he is coming as instead of Jesus, which means Antichrist in the Greek, instead of Christ. I wonder how many will be deceived at that time. We are told that most of the world will wonder after him in his supernatural ability, claiming to be the Lamb of God, come to rapture people away. It is very important that you understand this is a political system first, then this religious beast to follow, which causes all those to follow after the false system and to worship him as Christ. However, he is the false Christ. It's very important. This is the confusion. This is Babel to those that do not have eyes to see. Now, verse 12, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. This means that he prospers through one world control and causes the world to become and join in and apart. Now, verse 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men meaning visibly in front of them, that he will purposely worship uh, those that will uh, follow him. And by performing these miracles in their very sight, they will see that uh, if, if people today will worship, worship a rock star practically, when we see a supernatural being that can snap his fingers and make fire come from heaven in, on the earth and in the sight of men, that with these miracles, many will be deceived. My question would be, Will you be deceived by it when your father lets you know that this particular rich religious beast, this living creature, will perform miracles in the sight of men, and with people expecting the any moment rapture, they're going to be deceived. Will you be? I pray not. The dragon being the most beautiful of the archangels, as it is written, the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28. Listen now to 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, that's the political system, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. That they should make an image of this one world political system. And anytime you see an image, even on television, with world coverage of a one world political system that brings peace, and prosperity led by this religious beast. 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This is a strong statement. Our people are not equipped mentally to deal with something of this nature, something supernatural. Giving life to this system means that simply with his supernatural abilities, that he would make it seem that it was God's kingdom on earth. However, inasmuch as he is the prince of the air, certainly it is his kingdom on earth that only God allows, deceiving as many as would. Now 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Let's look at this very closely. Let's look back at what is commonly taught back as the mark of the beast, the barcode, 666 tattooed on the forehead. This would deceive no one. It clearly stipulates here that this is in the forehead. What is in your forehead? Your brain, your thinking process, your mind. Be sure and use your mind to make certain that you are not deceived in this end time. These that are expecting this so-called beast to insist you wear something on your forehead, that would deceive no one. Every Christian would recognize 666 and run from it. Now, in the forehead, a world religious system able to perform supernatural acts in the front of, and side of men, 
What about you? Will you be deceived? Again, I pray not. Don't be carried away in the great apostasy. Stand for the true Christ, for his word, as he has warned you here. It is not a tattoo. It is not a mark. It is your mind caused, causing you to worship someone else. Listen carefully. 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Just before the end, it will become difficult, perhaps, for some to buy or sell. But the penalty is, will you worship the false one? If you, can, if, if you cannot receive food or anything else other than by worshiping him, then know that our shepherd is able. He will always take care of us. God has stated, touch not mine elect, touch not mine anointed. How strong is your faith? Quite simply, he can take care of you wherever you are. Verse 18, listen carefully. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. I said a man, not some grotesque monster, not so co some comic book figure, but a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. We'll be coming back to this 18th verse to explain in detail this man. The word count in the Greek here is means to count by numerating stones over a long period of time. This mark was, was present for many years. Are you familiar with it? We're going to take a deep look at it before we come back to this verse. What we're looking at is not some monster with seven heads and ten horns, but a religious leader over a world system deceiving people into thinking that he is Christ himself. Again, will you be deceived? I think not. Now we're going to go to the epistles of John at this time to teach, if we may, from God's word, how that you can discern the spirits. And as you have heard, Antichrist shall come. Well, let's see what John has to say about it. The first epistle of John, as he writes so tenderly. The first epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 18. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, there are people that pretend they're from Christ, but are not. They're called Kenites, and we're going to talk about them. Let's skip on to 22 and pick this up. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. We have there what constitutes an Antichrist. Now, 23, whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. We know that many people in Judea do not accept Christ, but that is not to say that they are Antichrist, but you will find that the word Eudas means a son of Judah or a resident of Judea. And we're going to go very soon to Revelation 2, 9, or before we complete this message, and we will look better at this. Do not blame our brother Judah for that that the Kenites have done. K-E-N-I-T-E-S. What constitutes an antichrist? One that denies the Christ. And we will find who this one of Revelation 13 is. We're going to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul is speaking very clearly here and um, it's easy to follow. Don't read something into it. Try to do away as best you can with what you might have heard from man. And we take this second chapter of Second Thessalonians, and it reads, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. What's he talking about? He said, I quite simply want to talk to you about Christ returning to this earth, and we gathering back to him. Call it a rapture if you want to. However, he's coming here, and he's gathering back with us. Now verse 2, That you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't you believe anyone other than the word of God? He speaks here specifically to his first letter, whereby the rapture, so-called theory, comes to being in the fourth chapter of the first letter. They were excited about it, and he's writing again saying, don't be upset by it. Verse 3 gives the answer. Let's read it. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. This falling away is the apostasy, or the, dis the confusion brought on by Babel. It must come first before we gather back to Christ. 
and that man, not a beast system, but a man of sin, be revealed the son of perdition. This perdition, the sin of the world? No way. Apollia is what the word is in the Greek, and it's one of the base roots of Satan's name. And there is only one son that has been pr pronounced already to perdition, which is to say to perish, and that is Satan himself. Meaning what? Christ will not return, and don't let any letter or any spirit deceive you. He will not return to this earth until this son of perdition, the son that perishes, appears on earth first. How about you? Will you be deceived? Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, that's this man, called God or Jesus, or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God in Jerusalem, where the place of the temple, showing himself that he is God. Now let's get this real good. Before Christ returns to this earth, um, Paul tells us, this false one, this son that perishes, must sit in Jerusalem claiming to be God or Jesus, which is to quite simply say, instead of Christ or Antichrist. Now, verse 5. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? When I was with you, when I walked, we went into much more detail. Now, verse 6. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Remember those things, know those things I told you, the simplicity that you've already covered in this book, and you will understand it. Now, verse 7, listen to it very carefully. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. In the Greek, there is only a transitive verb which cannot stand alone. It has no subject or object. Therefore, it must connect back to he that was spoken of through verses 4 and 6. It, the verb must transfer back to that one that sits in the place claiming to be Christ, but in fact is the son that perishes. You will find in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, that it is Michael that casts this evil one out onto the earth along with his angels, that he will play the role of this Antichrist. Where it is written in that 12th chapter, Woe, woe to you that are on earth, rejoice in heaven, for the false one is thrown to the earth to deceive men. Again, my question would be, Will you be deceived at that time, or do you believe the word of God? Listen to the word of God. Verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed, that wicked one, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. In other words, when Christ returns to this earth, his mouth and tongue, Revelation 1.16, his voice is that sword that cuts both ways, the truth that will dispel these lies, and destroy them, and discover this one in his lies as he has deceived the world, will continue building the documentation to that. Verse 9, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, the deception, those miracles, the snapping of the finger, the lightning and fire coming from heaven, with man not being accustomed to supernatural events, will he deceive you? I think not. Verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, they won't study God's word, they won't study the truth, that they might be saved. You know, it is real sad that people will listen to man and church systems rather than reading God's word in its simplicity. Now, verse 11, listen carefully. And for this cause God, yes, even our Father, shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Will you believe that lie? The majority will. It is written. It is Father's word that states it will. Satan is very intelligent. He is not some 666 mark, but an entity that works supernatural powers. Now verse 12. That they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you, to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Beloved, do you understand God's word in its simplicity? In the simplicity in which Christ taught? Let's learn more of this man, this entity, from God's word. Not, not from some system, but from the word of God. We're going to go to Isaiah, the 14th chapter, one of the greatest prophets. And in this 14th chapter, we're going to learn of this false one. Where it actually speaks to... Uh, Lucifer, verse 12 of that 14th chapter of Isaiah. 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. The temple, the crown uh, throne was always on the north side. That being the throne side. Satan is saying here, Lucifer, whatever name you wish to call him, I'm above God. I'm above everyone. Verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will be God. That's what he's saying. Did Paul not adequately express this in chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians? I think so. Do you understand the word of God? Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. That pit is the abyss that we read of in Revelation chapter 20 as we near the time of the millennium. Verse 16, they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man? Underline that word man. Is this the man that made the earth to tremble that did shake kingdoms? Is this the man that took all the kingdoms of the world and brought into being a one world system? Though supernatural, ish as it is used here in the Hebrew, a certain man, yes, the dragon, Satan, Lucifer, verse 17, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the chief cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. In other words, would not allow the truth to come forth, but captivate by his lies and his babble, his confusion and mislead the world. 18, all the kingdoms of the nations, even all of them lie in glory, every one in his own house. The kings of the earth that follow you, he's being told here, will at least have a decent burial. Verse 19, but thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden underfoot. In other words, you're not even going to have a decent burial. Make a note of stones as is used here. By, remember the word count, as I told you from 18, that you would count that number of the beast by the enumeration of stones? Make a mental note of it. We are in the first advent, this first dispensation. We have the millennium coming up. People have Satan drawn as a, a demon in red long-handled underwear, two big horns, and a pitchfork. But I want you to know from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, exactly what he does look like, whereby you will be able to recognize him. Don't allow this one to deceive you. God's letter was written to you. Do you listen to man, or do you listen to thy father? Don't listen to any man without checking him out, not this man or any other man, without checking him out in the word of God. Now turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 28. Get your Bible out now and read this from his word along with me. I want to explain the word Tyrus to you in the Hebrew. It means rock or stone. This is the stone you must enumerate, knowing this one, this certain man, this Lucifer. Is this the man? You will know it is that man. Now we learn in verse 2, verse 28. Let's read it. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, you have so much pride, and thou hast said, I am God, I sit in the seed of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. So we see the pride, this one that is ish in the Hebrew, only a man, only a, God, a, a man that God created, who is Satan himself. Why is he called a man? Well, we'll find out here before we finish this chapter. Verse 3, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. You'll remember the wisdom of, of Daniel, the discerner of dreams. But this one is supernatural, and you must be prepared for that. For with thy wisdom and with thine understanding thou hast gotten thee riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. Tyre was a, com a city of commerce and was a play or a type on this certain situation that is carried even to the supernatural. Five, by thy wisdom, by thy great wisdom, and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. In other words, through commerce, you're able to make gains and riches in this world by using the people of this world. Six, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart 
as the heart of God. 7. Behold, therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom. I want you to note he's not a grotesque beast, but his beauty and his wisdom is mentioned here, and they shall defile thy brightness. Again, back to Isaiah 14. Is this the man? Verse 8. They shall bring thee down to the pit, and thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the seas. Verse 9. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Jesus Christ, the one with that sword of truth, will destroy his lies. And as Christ himself stated in Hebrews chapter, 14, chapter 2 of in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 14, I came to this earth in the flesh to destroy the de death, which is to say the devil. Verse 10, Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. And we see that he will die. As a matter of fact, we'll see in this chapter he's already been sentenced to death. 11, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Twelve, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now what this does, we're going now before he was the prince, he was the king. He was demoted. And we see him here in that full pattern, full of beauty, full of wisdom. Verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the God, garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And he continues with those stones, but note that he was in the garden of God. Make a mental note. Thy tablets and thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. In other words, he was not born, but God created him. One of the archangels that has fallen, created by God. And we're going to find out which cherubim here in a moment. But here we see him. Not something ugly. Not something in red long hunnel underwear with horns, but something beautiful. Now his position, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. That's right on God's altar. And the cherub that covereth is the cherub that was supposed to cover the mercy seat. Verse 15. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. In other words, he stopped loving God and began to take pride in himself. That one that was to protect the mercy seat wanted to be seated upon it. In other words, he that was to protect the seat of Christ wanted to be Christ, wanted to be that son of God. Though God created him as he did all others, his pride within himself, the big eye, caused and brought about his failure. Though full of beauty, be prepared, my friend, he will be cast from heaven onto this earth as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, and to bring deception even in all this beauty. Picture, if you would, in your mind a moment, the ark that Moses was ordered by God to build with a cherubim on each end of the mercy seat. This was his position in the world uh, that uh, before when he was this cherubim that covereth the one that was to protect that seat. Now, verse 16, by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. This is in a moral sense. And thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. In other words, you will be demoted from that seat, that place at the altar. What a letdown this must have been to this one that was so proud. 17, thine heart was lifted up. That's pride. Because of thy beauty, thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness or your splendor. I will cast thee to the ground. That's this earth. God stating, I will cast you to the earth. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Is this the man again from Isaiah? This took place when that first earth age was destroyed. Many do not and are not familiar with that first earth age. It was here at Satan's rebellion at the overthrow. And at that time, it is written of in Genesis verses, chapter 1, between verses 1 and 2 in the Hebrew, as well as in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23, that time of the overthrow and this great beauty that he gave unto this one. 
and his pride built him up. Now let's read his sentence, verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes. This is a Hebrew idiom that means to be finished, complete, ashes, in the, upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Where will it happen? On this earth in the sight of men. Yes, at the end of the Revelation 20. And we see Revel, uh, Isaiah 14 again. Is this the man? 19. All, that, all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Gone forever. That time of, of deception? Yes, for those that can be lied to, those that will allow themselves to be deceived. My question again, will you be deceived? Or do you understand the word of God? That old dragon, Lucifer, whatever title or name you wish to call him by, that play actor that wants again to move to that seat, that seat with the Messiah connotation, the mercy seat, he will come as the instead of Christ, or as some call Antichrist. And with that wisdom, he will be able to deceive, he will be able to bring that deception upon many. See that it's not you. It's simply this one fulfilling the role of Antichrist in the very sight of man upon this earth. Many think that they're going to be flown away first. They will not. Satan appearing on this earth. And we see then that deception as it comes to its fulfillment. In Romans chapter 11, it states there that God has set aside 7,000 that shall not bow a knee to this one in his deception and that they will be a witness. Do you have a destiny? Do you have a purpose? Have you known there was more to God's word that to God's word than what you had been taught? Well, our father knows. Continue the thought, if we may, concerning Satan, this beautiful one. And, and as Christ would mention him in Mark 13 and in the book of Revelation, and as in Ezekiel 28, where this beauty, the king of Tyre, this false rock, not our rock, their rock, we find that he had been in the Garden of Eden. So there's only one way we can, can discover the meaning of this is by going to the Garden of Eden. Now, John in the epistle mentions plural antichrist or plural, uh, plural people claiming to be of Christ. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Let's go to the garden. Let's find the root. Let's pick it up there from the word of God. Chapter 3, verse 1 reads, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now the serpent, of course, means the glistening one. And as serpent, the serpent is called that old dragon, which is to say the devil in Revelation chapter 20. And in telling the woman... Shall you not eat of every tree of the garden? As you know, God had stated, you shall not touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The other trees they could partake of. And this was the woman's answer. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, that's to say apples, plums, oranges, this sort of thing, verse 3, but of the fruit of the tree, the tree, meaning a specific tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Let's go break this back to the Hebrew for a moment, if we may. The word tree, as it is utilized in verse uh, uh, 1, states that it is etz, which means a tree of that nature. But then the base roots of the word etz is 6095 in the Strong's Concordance, and you should have one because you really need one to study God's word. And in this dictionary, the Hebrew dictionary in the Strong's, you will find that the Hebrew word etz comes from base root, which is 6086. You'll find it there as the base root of 6095, which is atash, which is to say an opening and a closing of the eyes. And from this also comes 6096, which is the backbone, the backbone of the body, which is to say the trunk of the body. Your arms are the limbs, and it is the tr a tree. A regular tree has only knowledge to shed its leaves, but the knowledge of good and evil, the trunk of the body, 
as many um, um, feelings that pass through the central nervous system. Now let's go a little further, if we may, lest ye die, was stated. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Verse 5, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Enlightenment, yes. And here you have the Hebrew word, which is the base, an opening or a closing of the eyes. And we have something here that is not complete as we read from the English, but from the trunk of the brain, the knowledge of good and evil, that you know what is good and you know what is evil, that Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, would state in the 2 Corinthians in verse 11, Paul states very clear there, speaking of this same incident. He said, Beloved, I want to talk to you about delivering you to Christ as a chaste virgin, not as Eve, who was beguiled by the serpent, now, the word beguiled is 1818 in your Greek dictionary of your Strong's Concordance. It has only one meaning. The word is expatio, and it has a meaning to be wholly seduced, so that you know what we are talking about. Now, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, naga, the word touch in verse 3, has more than one meaning, but it means to lie with a woman, to be more specific. Why would they know they were naked if they had eaten an apple? Open your minds. And fig leaves, this is part of the parable of the fig tree that Christ said, maybe you should know, but that you should learn the parable of the fig tree. And here the mark goes all the way back, a stone worn smooth over a long period of time. We come back to this same fig grove. Verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Verse 10, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11, And he said, Who told thee thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? In other words, God knew, of course, what had happened, that they had partaken of this tree. It had opened their eyes, their backbone, so to speak. If you check the Hebrew out, was involved within this. And verse 12, and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And we see old Adam trying to pass this off to the woman, but be that as it may. 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. I would remind you again of Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. The word beguiled, expatio, stated by Paul, wholly seduced. Open your mind, spiritually or physically. You live with it however you choose. Holy seduced. Verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, that's all beings on the earth, and above every beast of the field, every living creature on the earth. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. This state and this moral state of degradation, the serpent, Satan, being, the root thereof. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, that's her children and your children. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The bruising of the heel has to do with Christ being nailed to the cross. The bruising of Satan's head is, is has, in a sense, if you would, Satan's final defeat and his sentence to be uh, turned to ashes from within. Now, be realistic. Her seed and his seed. This speaks of a child, if you would. And in Mark 13, and rather in Matthew 13, God gives a parable concerning the sower, the seed, if you would, that was sown by the wicked one. We'll be going there perhaps in a moment, but bear that in mind. What are we talking about? And what did he say to the woman? We're talking about eating an apple. I haven't seen the word apple so far. 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. 
we find as this, this chapter continues, I wanted the sin brought forth, this conception. As this chapter continues on, we have the tree of life that is brought into existence. The tree of life, as it is written in Revelation 22, is none other than Christ himself. It was not yet time for that particular uh, deliverance of the Savior. So we skip on to chapter 4, and let's read there. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, that means they, uh, that she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, ish ith Yahweh. And she gave birth to Cain. But it would read by many that Adam certainly was his father. But bear in mind, listen to verse 2. And she again bare. What is this word again in Hebrew? Yashaf. It means to continue. If a woman continues in labor, what does that mean? She again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So we see in this that to continue in labor, they were twins. Twins both in the womb. Three and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. For an Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the flock thereof, the fat rather thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. It is important that you note that Cain and Abel were twins inasmuch as they matured and brought their offerings at the same time, that they were paternal twins, not identical twins, but twins of second pregnancies. Many do not realize that this happens. Talk to your doctor. Talk to your medical doctor and he will bring, make this clear. Verse 5, but unto Cain to his offering he had no respect and Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen? And it continues on that he murders his brother and the father asked him and when thou, he when, uh, and the Lord, uh, let's go down to verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is the Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. So we see that first murderer. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. Now we come to this mark in counting it, how to understand the mark of the beast. 13, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. 14, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. Here comes the mark. 15, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord shall set, then the Lord set a mark, I repeat, a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should uh, kill him. Now, I want to say that this mark is still present today in a spiritual sense, and we'll go no deeper than that on it. And you will see Cain's genealogy. It's important that you understand that uh, genealogy of Cain. Go on then, if you would, to chapter 5. This is the book of generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of man, or in, of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day that they were created, when they were created. And um, you will note that Adam's first offspring, because of Abel's death, was Seth. You do not find Cain. Do not find Cain listed in that genealogy. Now, let's go back to this garden again, if we may. I'm going to turn at this time to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to go to chapter uh, 31. And I want to read here, if I may, verse 1 of 31, the book of Ezekiel. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom art thou like in thy greatness? He's asking Pharaoh here, who do you think you're like? And verse 3, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. This word Assyrian is box cedar in the Hebrew. Assyrian has no article in the garden, but meaning Satan, all right? And um, we uh, see this, and we see from this, as Ginsburg, uh, and I agree with him, that this is Asha, Tiasha in the Hebrew, which is to say, the box cedar. In other words, Satan claimed to be tall, splendor as the cedars of Lebanon, which is symbolic of our people. 
but he was a plain old box cedar. And he states concerning this cedar in this third verse, chapter 31, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and, and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great, the deep set him up on high, with her rivers running round about his plants, and set out her little rivers into all the trees of the field. And we continue on then, if you would, and down to um, verse 7. Thus was he fair in his greatness and the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. This is none other. You figure it out yourself. Verse 8. The cedars in the garden of God, and this is Eden, the garden of Eden, could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs. The chestnut trees were not like his branches. Nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Again, that one that God made the full plat pattern, full of beauty. 9. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden, these trees symbolic of people, the backbone, the tree of knowledge you should not take of, this box cedar, Satan. The trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his top among the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. That's to say the nations properly translated. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. It was at that time that Satan was demoted, as we read in the book of Ezekiel, from the king of Tyre to the prince of Tyre. Go, if we may, for a moment to Genesis 6, following the genealogy of Adam as it was given. And we find that the Nephilim, which is a Hebrew word that means the fallen angels, came. Chapter 6, verse 1 of Genesis, And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, verse 2, that the sons of God, that's these Nephilim, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now let there be no doubt as to why a man takes a wife, because, um, and God continues in verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. In other words, God had created the flesh body as he had Adam and placed the soul within it. Verse 4, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now know this, God's plan was that Christ would come through the woman's seed, therefore his heels bruised, but certain's head, the serpent's head, destroyed. And you might say, some will say, how did Cain go through this flood and how did all these things come to pass? Know this, that even in the wilderness, even in the wilderness, God uh, uh, fed the children as they wondered angel's food. Angel's food sustained the body of man. Why? Because we're made in their image, exactly like them. Different substance, yes, but the body the same as far as the male is concerned. Now, how did Cain live through the flood? We have that first murderer. We have that one that the mark was placed upon. How did he live through that flood? God has already stated here very clearly that he had made man in flesh. And as Noah was found the only one that was perfect, that is to say in generations, as we find in the ninth verse of this sixth chapter, um, then that generation, the prime root, is that he, his family and his sons had not intermixed with these fallen angels to bring forth Geba. Therefore, God telling Noah to take two of every flesh aboard the ark. Verse 19 of this sixth chapter. And of every living thing of all flesh. Well, man was flesh. So whether you believe the flood was worldwide or not, this gives us account of the Kenite having the possibility of being taken on the ark. Two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. Now, what is the word Kenite? The word Kenite simply means being translated from the Hebrew rather than transliterated. It means sons of Cain. Did they live through the flood? You bet they did. As we find in First Chronicles uh, in the Old Testament, in chapter 2, 
and in verse 55 where the, gen the generations of the various 12 tribes are given, tacked on to the tribe of Judah, we read in the fifth, 55th verse of chapter 2, 1 Chronicles, thusly, and the families of the scribes, and note they were scribes, not, didn't say they were the family of Judah, but the family of the scribes which dwelt at Jabez, the Tiothrites, Shemathites, the Shushathites, these are the Kenites, K-E-N-I-T-E-S, again, sons of Cain, that came of Hemath, the father of the house of Rechab. Let's recap this. What have we discovered? The seed had arrived on earth, Cain being the, Cain being the first murderer. He was not listed in Adam's genealogy. And we see that he still survived the flood. And this man in sin, this man of sin, would appear again, as we have already discovered from other places. And we see, we see these uh, things that are given forth. And here we see the documentation that God himself would bring these upon the earth. We see that some of the events that happened from the serpent, that old devil, the dragon. What are you to do about that as a Christian? Christ does not leave us wanting, but he teaches us very adequately in chapter 13 of the book of Mark in the New Testament. Let us go there. Let us begin with verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered, and Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. When would that be? naturally at those events that would consummate the end of this age. Verse 3, And he set up on the mount, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, For tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be a sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? In other words, tell us when the end of the world will be. The question many men have asked, he's going to tell you. Verse 5, And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. Verse 6, See, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Anyone that claims to be teaching Christ and does not teach his word is not of Christ. Verse 7. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. In other words, what is the opposite of war? It's peace. When they cry, peace, peace, peace. 8. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places. And there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Now, this famine is for hearing God's word as it is written in Amos chapter 8. Uh, I think I believe it is verse 7 through 8. Verse 9 of this 13th chapter of Mark. But take heed to yourselves, Christ warning you, beloved, for they shall deliver you up to councils, that Sanhedrians. And in the synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. In other words, delivered up before the false Messiah because you would not uh, receive him. Verse 10, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. And here we have the gospel being published through God's elect, those that are delivered up, being given a trial at this great conversion, if you would, in this synagogue. Verse 11, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. This is Christ speaking through you. This is that on that day of Pentecost when they spoke an example of this that would come. That God himself through the Spirit, when you're delivered up, will speak for you. Verse 12, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. Now think about this, beloved. A parent's not going to deliver a child to death, nor vice versa, but Satan is death. That is his name, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. And if someone of your relatives believes that he is Jesus, they will go to him and say, my son is a good son, or my daughter is a good daughter, my mother is a good Christian, or my father is a good Christian. Please be patient with them and convert them, thinking they were doing well. And in this method are God's elect delivered up uh, for a witness for Jesus Christ. 13. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And certainly they shall be. Verse 14, But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. 
then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, in the book of Daniel, you find in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 that this word it should be he because it states there when the desolator comes in on the wings of abomination in the Hebrew tongue that he will appear in Jerusalem claiming to be Christ. Yes, claiming to be Jesus Christ. We'll talk more of that in a moment. 15, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house. In other words, the time for the destruction of this place, which was the opening subject in chapter 13, you won't need anything out of the house. 16, and let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. You won't need a change of clothes. 17, but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. In other words, as Paul stated in 2 Corinthians, he wants to present you as a chaste virgin. And when Satan and his angels are cast out on this earth, and as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, then we're not talking about a mother carrying a natural child. We're talking about someone that has been impregnated in their mind, in their forehead, with this fake mark, and believe that this is Jesus, that the false Christ, thinking he is the true Christ. Verse 18, and pray you that your flight be not in the winter. Harvest is always in the summer. 19, for in those days shall be affliction, that's tribulation, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created into this time, neither shall be. A tribulation of the false Christ claiming to be Jesus. 20, and except that the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh, repeat, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. 21, and then, if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. Why? He's a fake Christ. Don't go along with it. You've been warned. See that you're not deceived. 22. Why? For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. That's not, that's not possible, beloved. Verse 23. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you all things. And then immediately following this, we see the return of the true Christ. Verse 24, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. It will be shadowed at times it is, as it is written in Revelation 8, but totally blocked out. Why? Because of the brightness of his coming. 25, And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. 26, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. In other words, the true Christ returning. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, that's the four spirits, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. How, beloved, do we know when this shall come to pass as far as seasons are concerned? He's going to tell you that also. Listen carefully. Now learn, not maybe, but learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So ye in like manner, when you shall see those thi these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, yes, even at the door. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Know this, beloved, know this, that the generation of the parable of the fig tree, that fig tree was planted in the year 1948 when both the good and the bad uh, seed returned to Jerusalem. That has never happened since the time Christ walked the earth, set up as a nation, both good and bad figs, as it is written in Jeremiah chapter 24. See that you're not deceived at that time. You have been warned from the word of God. I have a question. Do you have a destiny? Have you known since you were a child there was more to God's word than had been explained to you? Think about it. Now, let's sum this a moment. Christ has told you the false Messiah will come and what you will do at that time. You will be perfectly well protected. Now, when Jesus spoke of the book of Daniel and this abominable thing, he made the book of Daniel a part of the New Testament. That is to say, it was yet to come to pass. He was speaking of, as I had stated, the 27th verse in that ninth chapter of Daniel. I want to go there. I'm going to read it for you. And it reads, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. This is not the true Christ. This is the false Christ that shall cause this oblation. The oblation is what we call today our Holy Communion. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Now, properly translated in the Hebrew, it said, On the wings of a desolator he shall come 
with abomination, even until the consummation, that means the end, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate, desolate, which should be translated, shall be poured upon the desolator. There you have it. He that will come in peaceably. He that will continue on. Now, Moffat in Mark 13 translated when he stands where he ought not. Why? Because the Greek is determined, the word used for it or he or she, is determined by the subject. The subject, as you can well see from this 27th verse, is this, that we're not talking about a condition but an entity, the desolator. And so that you might know, let's turn to to uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. And let's read briefly here that we're not talking about a condition, but an individual. Verse 31 of chapter 11. An arm shall stand on his part and shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. When Christ was crucified, this took away the daily oblation forever. Verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people who do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. How about you? Do you really know your father? Will you do exploits for him as he requested of you in Mark 13? Verse 33, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. This would still, if you would, would run from the time the daily sacrifice was taking, e taken, even to this generation. 34, Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Listen to this. This is a fall like to stumble. But a little help from God, beloved, is all you need because you become strong. 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall, that's to say stumble, to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. 36, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. There he goes again, taking the place of Christ, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, that is to say, that that a mother would for her child, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not, while he uh, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and and precious, uh, uh, pleasant things. Now let's go all the way to the last verse. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. That's Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Now what have we analyzed? We have found that he appears in Judea, as stated in Mark 13, on Mount Zion, claiming to be Christ. We have found out approximately when the generation, if you would, of the good and bad fig tree passes by. How long is a generation? From 1948, a 40-year generation, a 70 generation, a 120-year generation, no one knows. But we do know the season because God has made it available for us to know and to understand. Do you? Do you understand what happened in the garden? We're going to turn to Matthew 23 to understand again that the garden is also mentioned or the event that took place there uh, in uh, even the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 23, we find there that Christ himself, as he is giving the, uh, the woes that we find in that 23rd chapter, I'm going to start reading in verse um, 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. In other words, you offspring of the serpent, the snake. How can, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you the prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your, scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Who slew Abel? Of course it was Cain. That's who we're talking about. Unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barakas, the whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. So you see, we find many places in the New Testament after your eyes are open to the truth, how Christ himself speaks of this seed of Cain planted upon this earth. Is it any wonder that God placed this mark, the mark of deception even if you would, the mark called um, even if you would uh, the mark of the beast. But understand, it is that you are not to worship him, but to stay loyal, stay a virgin to the true Christ in a spiritual sense that you might understand. I want to go to the 13th chapter of Mark concerning the parable of the tares. 
If you don't understand this parable, Christ said you wouldn't understand any of his uh, parables. Therefore, it is imperative that you understand this 13th um, chapter of Matthew, where he speaks of this parable. And he explains it in verse 24, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now tares are as a wine in the Greek, and it, it looks like wheat when it's growing, but it comes forth with a bitter seed. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared, then appeared the tares also. You could tell the difference between the wheat. Now, in the 36th verse and 7th, Jesus is explaining here, if you would, not the tares, but the fact that he's explaining the parable whereby anyone might understand it. They ask him, verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. 37, He answered and said unto them, He that sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. Do you understand that? The good seed, Adam and Eve, and those people created on the sixth day. The field is the world. The good seed are the children. I repeat, children, not wheat, not zawan, but the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Do you know who the wicked one is? Let him make it clear then. 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So here again, we see that event that happened in the garden, that wicked seed that was planted that would bruise the heel, if you would, of he that would be Messiah in his crucifixion. But then Messiah, in turn, would destroy even that wicked one. I want to go to another place to nail down the seed, if you would, of Cain. St. John chapter 8. I want to pick it up here where Christ is speaking, if you would, and teaching concerning the children of Abraham. For there were those that claimed to be of our brother Judah and did lie, but were the children of the devil. And Jesus knew this. They claimed to be children of Abraham. He says, I know you're children of Abraham. Why? The word Abraham in the Hebrew means the father of many nations. In other words, through Abraham would come Christ, and Christ would be a blessing to all nations. Christ declared that in verse 37, that knowing this. And they continue on and get a little nervous. And in verse uh, 39, they state... Uh, they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the work of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Note the small f. Not our father, their father, Tyre. Then said they to him, We be, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceedeth forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Listen carefully. Verse 44 of the 8th chapter of St. John. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Again, who was the first murderer? You know, we read it from our father's word, Cain. And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? Christ was perfect. And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Listen, this is from the mouth of Christ. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So there you have it, beloved. There you have the truth from the word, uh, words of Jesus Christ. Do you have ears to hear? Will you be deceived? Do you have a destiny? I want you to go with me. I had told you in Mark 13 that Christ had shortened the time. Revelation chapter 9, Christ tells us the length of time. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven upon the earth, and unto the earth, rather, and to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. Two, and he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. In other words, this is the substitute or the fake of the sun and the moon disappearing, only darkened by Satan's deception. Three, and there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth, and upon them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. 
a scorpion, it is important when Christ uses something of this nature that you understand his method. A scorpion has, scorpion has no stomach, therefore he holds his victim with his pinchers and regurgitates his digestive juices and the victim's body becomes his stomach. In other words, he turns his backbone to mush. And that's the way Satan operates spiritually, turning the backbones of people to mush. Four, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men, repeat, those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. Now, what is the seal of God in their forehead? It is their, their tru the truth of God's word in their forehead rather than the lies and the deception of Babel or Babylon. Five, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. There you have it, five months rather than three and a half years. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, which he's, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. When they see the true Christ coming, they will be ashamed to face him. And the shapes of the locust were like unto horses prepared into battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. In other words, we're not dealing with locusts. We're dealing with men. We're dealing with those fallen angels. We're dealing with the serpent. We're dealing with the Antichrist, the false Jesus. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and their breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and of the sound of their wings as it were the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. In other words, the number of them will be many. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Again, that five-month period, 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, Satan, my friend, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is a badon, that's the destroyer. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, that is Satan's name. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And of course, that sixth angel sounds, and we see, if you would, that deception for that five-month period. Are you ready for that? Will you be deceived? You must remember that God is in control. As we recap and think on these things, what kind of father do we have? We have a father that loves his children. He wants them to know the truth. He is calling out a people that are willing to study his word, the simple message that he put forth. There will be a millennium time coming when Satan will be locked away for a thousand years. Those that have allowed themselves to be deceived by him in a sense, or this is their innocence for any sin committed in ignorance is no sin. But that does not mean that they're going to heaven necessarily, but God will set aside a time that is called the millennium. We find that in the 20th chapter. I want to complete this tape by going there. 20th chapter, verse 1, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit with a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, and which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That's a millennium, beloved. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them which were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. This is those who have passed on in the past that were beheaded, crucified, and even you in this end time, not killed, but witnessing, refusing to receive that mark on, in their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. What is reign? It's teaching. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. You will take part in that first resurrection if you have the truth. But the others must wait until Satan is released, as you will find in this chapter, a short season. Well, we're going to wrap this tape up at this time. Do you want to study further in God's Word? Then continue studying. If this has been a blessing to you, then order more tapes on the various subjects for beginners that will take you deeper into God's word. Will you reign with him, teach him with him? He will help you. He is your shepherd. And you know something? He loves you very much. Do not be deceived. Do you have a destiny?